started writing up his work and his first experiments that he wanted to do and uh, published those in the Gallenberg, Tennessee Symposium on Operating System Principles, which was this fantastic symposium in the woods in, in Gallenberg, Tennessee that um, all of us went to back then because it was, it was uh, uh, where the uh, scientists went to communicate with each other in a small meeting. And it was really uh, an interesting meeting because Al presented his paper, or one of his people actually presented it, and I presented my paper on the design of the ARPANET. I had by that time been um, procured to come to ARPA and, and uh, run this program, and I presented that paper. And so we both gave that um, paper in Gallenberg and then talked about it. I skipped one step, that's how I got to ARPA. Uh, Bob Taylor, when we were setting up this meeting, wrote a big long email to all of us telling, uh, saying what he really wanted us to say about his involvement in this and his memory of it. And one of the things he particularly wanted me to mention was how I came to ARPA. Uh, after he and Bob, uh, I mean, after Bob Taylor and, and Ivan had been working on me for about a year, Bob finally had sold the idea, idea to the head of ARPA, Charlie Hirschfeld, and told him that, you know, we really ought to have this network uh, technology being developed and we needed this guy at Lincoln Labs, and he wouldn't come because he was too interested in doing research. So Charlie said, oh, I can take care of that. So he picked up the phone and called the director of Lincoln Labs. The director of Lincoln Labs, he told, um, you realize that we fund 51% of all your work at Lincoln Labs, <laughs> and we would like this guy down here next week. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, the director called me in his office and said, I think it's in the best interest of both of us. <laughs> take this job in Washington, and we'll guarantee that you know you you, uh, would, you know that you don't have any problem in, in transition and so on, and you can go there working for us and so on. So it, I got twisted my arm into going down and taking a management position, which is probably uh, as Bob said, that Bob said he blackmailed me into fame. Uh, so in any case, that that got me to ARPA, and I started working on the design. In, in earnest, and uh, published this paper. And when when I got together with the people in uh, at uh, the conference in Gatlinburg, uh one they told me about the work that Paul Barron had done, and that I had looked that up. And uh, two, they told me that uh, I only used the word packet, which was great. And three, they told me that I was thinking of lower speed lines, and a lot of them. And they said, no, go to higher speed lines, you get much better response time than, you know, uh, probably the same cost when you're all through. Uh, so I started thinking about using 50 kilobit lines, which was the highest speed available at that time. And so they made me shift in, in, in that sense, which was very beneficial because it raised the speed of the network considerably. And um, then I went back and read Paul's papers, which actually we had in the Pentagon where, where the office was and available, even though they weren't uh, widely available, um, and found about the updated routing and so on. And so we talked. I talked to Paul and, and integrated what we could of what he had thought. And so at that point in '67, we integrated the ideas of the three of us and uh, into the design of the network. It turned out that the only network that ever got funded out of all these three efforts was the ARPANET because uh, Donald Davies never had funding in England to build a network, and neither did Paul. The Air Force, in fact didn't really, was scared of the idea and didn't do anything with the reports that he had written. So that until, in fact, we actually had the ARPA funding, there was no, uh, there was no, nothing moving forward. And of course, ARPA is very uh, uh, known for moving forward in, in this kind of area and undertaking something which may be somewhat risky. Um, so that's basically the uh, prehistory. The, the ideas that we had about what was for was really we wanted to test and demonstrate uh, the design and the communications technology, uh, see that this new communication technology would work, what its economics were, and how it would operate, and demonstrate that. We wanted to uh, permit the sharing of computer resources between all the computers in the ARPA community, and in fact, to work out the technology for sharing computer resources in general. Because at that point in time, there wasn't the, such a thing as uh, PCs on everybody's desk, everybody's desk where you could get the same piece of software. Every computer was almost different. And you know, we had the TX2 at Lincoln, it was one of a kind, the, the, the 
to it at FTC, which is Robert Ryan, a number of deck BDP tens which could share software. But outside of a few uh, manufacturers and series, there wasn't uh, a great sharing of any kind of software or even uh, uh, documents. Uh, the documents were typically in different formats and different machines. And so we had a difficult time sharing everything. Uh, and everything had to be done over from scratch, which is sort of a difficulty because you wrote this great compiler and nobody else could use it. <laughs> so one of the things that we wanted to do was share those resources. The other thing that we, I saw in that was that ARPA had not been buying computers for virtually every one of the research organizations it was doing business with, uh, 20 or 30 such organizations. And all these computers all over the place were costing a lot of money and they were only being used part of the day and the people in the rest of the country could easily share those resources and, and uh, we could save a considerable amount of money. So that was another goal. And another goal was to let people access them from anywhere. So we could let people who weren't, didn't have a computer get into them all over the country. And uh, time sharing at that time was a local phone call was about the best you could do. If you had to do a long distance phone call, it wasn't very economic or attractive. So that we uh, saw that getting into these computers from further away would be very effective. And then we uh, saw we needed to develop a lot of other technology for computer networks uh, in the area of electronic mail with interfaces, protocol, and all of the protocols associated with it. And so we undertook to do a lot of those things. <coughs>
<laughs> we went to AT&T to invite them to participate, but they said, no, this was not viable, and they refused to start with the problem. It wasn't the technology that would work. Um, I then gave a speech at the Defense Communications Agency, which I remember vividly, because people essentially threw rock tomatoes at me. Uh, I've never been so impressed with people entrenching us to change as I was at this meeting. I talked about what this was and what the economics would be like and how it would work, and the audience was so hostile, and the questions were so hostile, that it was as if we were, I was threatening each one of them personally. And what it was, as I figured out over time, and this is probably the biggest lesson I learned from the whole thing, was that people hate change. And uh, this, in fact, for them, was an underlying philosophy of humanity. Their whole technical uh, background was built on, well, you do it this way. You do it, and they had all these building blocks built up, which were built on circuit communications. And so if I changed those building blocks, if I destroyed that foundation, they'd have to rethink everything they knew. Mm -hmm. And so they basically didn't want to do that. They weren't willing to change their basic concepts. Even if I could prove my point with, with uh, logic, uh, they weren't willing to make the mental shift and then do that and because it was so much work to rethink it all. So one of the things I learned is don't ever build such a foundation here and don't like to touch it because something liable to change. I mean, build it carefully, but be willing to go in and change anything if you have to. And, and realize that people really do need to shift their mind if they're going to succeed. And shortly after this, I learned later on in the network, uh, as we built the ARPANET, we built it all up on the uh, concept of datagrams and datagram technology, and then I went on to build the virtual circuit networks later on. All of the people who had done the datagram thing said, no, we can't change. We have to stay with what we have, uh, because they like that. They had done that now for many years, which actually is, is uh, uh, very valuable in certain contexts and, and not in other contexts. And so now I think we straighten that out more over time to where each one is valuable. But at that time, you know, there was this huge philosophical argument, even between the people who had all undergone this change in 67 and 9, now by 1973 we were having a new argument about which way to go. And, uh, and it was that people, again, couldn't change. The, the project, uh, uh, and ARPA had all of the research contracts at MIT and Stanford and all of the big uh, uh, research locations, plus at the uh, uh, defense locations like RAND and Lincoln Labs and so on, were all asked to connect to this network. Uh, we had to connect all our computers together. Well, the first thing they all said is, I don't want to give up any of my computer time to anybody else. Go away. Um, and their reaction was totally hostile themselves. They even these were the computer people who were being funded by ARPA. Uh, and there was one or two people, like Lick Leiter, who had been spearheading the whole concept for many years. He started the program at ARPA in, in uh, the early 60s and had started time sharing in, in terms of ARPA's original funding. And he had always pushed for networking and computers. And so he actually helped very much push this concept through with a lot of them. But there was a lot of hostility from all those people because they thought they had their resource and they had just, you know, they worked hard to get up to buy them that computer and they didn't want to give up an inch of it. And, um, the uh, result of the network, it turned out, was it gave them all computer, more computer power. Each one of them had much more than they ever had before because they had access to everybody else's and they could share files and they could share programs and they could share uh, stuff. But two of the people who complained the most were Vinsky and McCarthy there. <laughs> 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 and, and as soon as they did it, they found they could cooperate on, some, on, on papers they were writing over the network. And so then, then they, and, you know, a year or two later, they said, this is great. Now I can you know, write co-author papers with, with each other. So, in fact, you know, they turned around after a couple of years, but it, it really was uh, difficult to convince a lot of these people. So that was uh, another problem that came up. And then, this is some subsequent to the ARPANET, but after uh, we had built the ARPANET and it worked beautifully and it was commercially viable and, and, and it looked very attractive, it hadn't been proven commercially yet, but it was, it was very attractive and, and people in the government found it very economic. Uh, I went to at and again and I said, how would you like to take this over? Uh, we've decided in the government we don't really need this anymore to be operated as a research thing. We like it operating as a commercial network. And how would you like to run it for us? We'll buy back the service so you don't, don't lose a penny. And then you can offer more service to everybody else and you'll make tons of money. And they said, they actually had a whole committee convened and they thought about it for quite a while and they said, no, this is totally compatible with our network and our network philosophy and it won't work, so we won't touch it. Um, it actually would give them a monopoly early in time and, and much earlier in time than anything else. Yeah. How big was the network? Um, when I was about 
30 nodes in the network. Uh, many, many computers on it. Um, and, and 50 kilobit lines between all of them. Major, major size network, actually, by um, those days standards. Yeah, so it was a uh, millions of dollars a year communication strategy. So it was, it was a major uh, activity, and one that um, they uh, that anybody in, in starting to do commercial service would have loved to have that base, you know, in terms of business, but um, they didn't want it. So I went and started, started my own company to do it, because they weren't willing to do it, so we started going at it at that point. Um, Going back to, to how this network actually got built. After designing it and, and uh, uh, working out the details of what we wanted, uh, we went out on bid, uh, wrote an RFP, went out on bid to industry to, to build the, the network control processor and uh, um, provide that to the government. And then uh, we would connect it to all of the computers in the network. And, uh, one of, the, one of the results of that bid was we got nice bids from a lot of companies, like Wolf Brand and Newman, who won the bid, uh, saying this is great, you know, we'll bid on it, and we'll use this mini computer, and, and this is how we'll do it, and it'll cost this much. And from IBM and CDC, the two big computer companies of the day, we got back, well, this is too, totally impossible, you can't possibly do it, it's, you know, the computers would be far too big, uh, you know, they were thinking of using well 50s for the switching computer. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they wouldn't even consider bidding it. Uh, because they said it was unviable again. So uh, we didn't get anybody like that to do it, which was good. We didn't get any, uh, see that was necessary. And many computers were fairly new, uh, and so the company, uh, the bid, had uh, just bought one of the commercial many computers that was in the market. So it was contracted to BBN, and um, within, uh, by the end of 1969, uh, we had the first three nodes installed. They'd actually progressed very rapidly at that point. And we installed the three nodes here on the West Coast at uh, SRI and UCLA and, and the University of Utah. And uh, formed the first piece of the network. Installed the, the little mini computers and they came up and it started working fairly quickly, uh, connecting those three computers. Now, you've got to realize that the connection to the computer at that point in time was not a standard host protocol, uh, which made it really easy. It was a lot of interface work to the computer to make it work right. Special hardware interface and, and uh, uh, a lot of work on the computer people's part. But we got that done at those sites so that they could start communicating and it, that worked. What were those uh, Well, one was, um, I think the, the uh, I'm not going to say it wrong if I have, but I think it'll be on the first slide, I think. Yes, sir, I was the SDS for yeah, uh, let me look at the slide and we'll get that straight, but yeah. Okay, so that was the, the uh, situation then. And then uh, on the Avenet grew quickly through 1971. We kept on adding nodes very rapidly because there was a lot of interest and a lot of the sites needed to get on in order to do the, the job we wanted. And we started developing what was called a terminal interface processor. Instead of just this box to connect the computers, we connected and we had a box that incorporated that function, but also had a terminal pad, as, you, as we now call it, the, the, the uh, pad function, so that we could have a terminal interface processor that uh, took all of the keystrokes of people tying in with terminals and turned them into packets and sent them off to the computer. So you didn't have to be on a computer to use another computer. You could just have to be on a dial-in connection or a global connection. And that made it even grow even faster. Now the, the initial network, uh, oh you can leave that on, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, leave it, but, uh, <laughs> no, turn it off and we okay. can both to be no. Okay. <laughs> okay, the, the, uh, the situation with the network in 1971, which is the first map that I still have, uh, is that we had all these maps connected. This is before the, the uh, tips were introduced. And they were at these locations. The first three nodes you see is uh, SRI and CDC 10 at that point. It may have started off with a different computer, I'm not sure. Uh, and we had UCLA with, with the Sigma 7 and the 36091 and uh, PEB-10 at the University of Utah. 
1972, the physical map had grown to something like 25 uh, nodes, I think this is, or more or less. Um, and we had put on
uh, when you're using it and utilize the full inputs, which is very hard to use typically, and get down to mailing a deck tape, which was uh, like 20 cents or mailing an IBM tape, which is even less. The ARPANET, as you heard already, there's 11 cents or so. So this, that's where it fit in, right at the bottom, the low deck tape and the bottom of IBM tape. It was, in fact, a very economic alternative compared to all of these. This is how uh, the, the uh, delay then was stacked up in terms of block size. If you're sending bigger and bigger blocks, of course, you can do much more efficiently. And the effective bandwidth of the network in terms of the bits per second for that block was what you could get with various kinds of networks. So if you had a dial-up network, that you had a big delay to get started, and so your effective uh, bandwidth was uh, much lower for any given block size, whether you were dialing 2 kilobits or 50 kilobits. If you built a fully connected super Oracle in that, you could do fairly well. But with a 50 kilobit star, you could do a lot better in terms of the response time. With the ARPANET, uh, I could even do better. And that was because I, didn't, I could afford uh, 50 kilobits, which is almost like, and have a much better topology switching them. So we could have a much better response time for that kind of network than any of the other alternatives that were there. Uh, and that was primary reason for that. In terms of economics, this is the cost per megabit uh, from the 11 cents down up to $10, and the uh, delay in getting the message to where you're going for a 10 kilobit message. Now, the dial-up alternatives are way up there in the corner, very expensive and very slow, 10 seconds and so on. The fully interconnected net, which was the first thing people thought of when they started building the net, was reasonably cheap but reasonably slow because it was so slow. You could build a fully interconnected 19 kilobit net, but it got very expensive because you had all the capacity you couldn't use. And the airplane net was very economic, and so it was radically better than these alternatives, and that's, that's the kind of economics we looked at at that point in time. Back in that time frame, I published this graph, and we'll have an updated version of it in a minute, but this is the uh, initial one that was published, and this was the 69 crossover, as it's called, fairly famous at this point in time been reprinted many, many times. And basically, it's the incremental cost of moving the land bit, the kilopackets, uh, over a network. And there's comp two components to that cost. One is the cost of computing, to do the computation to start and forward it, to, to make to let you use little messages instead of just opening our communications lines. And the other is the cost of the communication, the cost of leaf lines to move those bits. Now, that's the same for packet switching or circuit switching or any kind of switching. But the cost of computing, which is the speed line, coming down very rapidly with time, because computers, of course, and the cost of semiconductors came down very rapidly with time, uh, was making the cost of doing that extra computing to make it more effective uh, come down very rapidly. The total cost of packet switching was then the sum of the two. Circuit switching, which was the alternative at those, that point in time, was to use the same communication line, but 15 times less efficiently, because that's the block, that's the peak to average ratio of, of communication at that day. Uh, 15 to 1, you would, you would have a peak rate of 15 times your average rate. And so given that, you, uh, you crossed over with uh, that sort of thing back in 1962. It would be cheaper to do packet switching. But packet switching itself, the, uh, the point where it became um, crossover between the cost of communications and the cost of computing was in 1969, and that's when, in fact, we started the ARPANET. So we didn't start it until about seven years after it became economic. By, by that time, it was about uh, ten times more economic than the alternative. And that's probably true of any technology shift. In other words, if a new technology is along, you probably won't realize that it's better, you won't probably try it, you won't even think much about it until uh, it's about ten times better than the alternative. Uh, you may be able to think of it earlier and recognize that it's going to be there and follow these trends and project that you should do it. That's a good thing to do. But historically, people don't really recognize it until somewhat later in time. The fact that we did it at that point in time is really remarkable in itself. Um, didn't wait another decade. Um, now, this goes on in the future. Let me wait for a second on that. I don't want to get into that uh, yet. So let me uh, turn on the lights here and uh, go back to the, uh, to the other slide for a second. <coughs> now, that, that was 
been a, an upper net. It, it actually grew to 73. We then, we then in fact, uh, recommended that it be uh, turned over to uh, uh, the AT&T, as you heard, and we decided after the AT&T refused it to turn it over to commercial operation within the government, and the DCA took it over and started operating it. That worked for a while. Eventually, it uh, kept on growing because nobody stopped it, and nobody had the guts to turn it off, and so it kept on growing until it became the internet over time. Uh, it just uh, kept on growing as time went on and kept on being removed from agency days and he finally wound up with that death. Um, meanwhile, uh, in 1975, I went to uh, start Telenet uh, in 73. And by 75, we had not only created the first public packet pack net to prove this commercially, but uh, established the standards with TCIPT of X25, so we had a host interface that would uh, be standard and available to, to be implemented by everybody. Uh, that was a major factor in making things work, and at that point in time, getting X25 passed within a year or so was a remarkable circumstance because you know how long standards tend to take. But there were only five countries in the world that cared, and only one group in each country. Uh, nobody else cared about packets at that point in time. So England, France, uh, United States, not AT&T, but Telenet. Uh, and uh, Japan got together, and uh, Canada, and decided to go do this and create a standard. And so we pointed out, France is the biggest problem, they kept on arguing. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we finally got to a standard uh, that worked, uh, partially because someone had already implemented it, and they knew that it worked, and we could prove it. And so we got that uh, standardized by 1975, and could proceed with commercial service, effectively. Um, not very long after that, we started. Uh, I started working on what we, we should do next, and uh, looked at uh, shorting up the packet and fixing the length so that we could do it in hardware. Because clearly, doing it in software, as you saw in that curve, the computing hardware was getting cheaper and cheaper. The first, the first imp we had for switching had memory of one or two k memory and an extremely slow processor. I mean, it was like um, you wouldn't believe how bad it was. <laughs> And so we had very little buffer space to do anything, and everything was very difficult to do. But as machines got faster, very rapidly, I figured we were able to do almost anything you could think of, and, and we were able to do very much better in terms of the switching technology. And so we could do something much more fancy. Now we started thinking of, well, to do it at really high speeds, we had to get to hardware doing it. And uh, that was sort of the concept of ATM in its first stages. So we started working on the standards in 1980 and the CCIPT for this. Meanwhile, I, at the end, was being propagated there, so we had to fight, you know, on the side and not bother those people because they were they had their train rolling. Um, and so we moved along with the, the ATM standard in the sideline and moved that forward. And actually, that took a lot longer. But by 1987 or 8, we actually had the standard for ATM uh, established. Uh, there was still a fight between the people who wanted 64 byte and 32 byte cells, and uh, between Europe and the United States, and that ended up in a compromise, 48 plus the header. Uh, <laughs> not really what either group wanted, but. Uh, <laughs> what does ATM stand for? Uh, Asynchronous transfer mode is the uh, ATM, and that was the French name. They they didn't like uh, uh, anything that had. Uh, packet switching or anything else in it, they wanted to keep away from that and do something that was politically insensitive and, and, and uh, just instead of synchronous transfer mode, asynchronous transfer mode. So they just wanted to make it very, very politically neutral, and that was their turn. Um, now that was actually standard, but the standardization of that made a huge difference because now we had uh, a, a viable standard which would work not only for uh, data but for voice and video because now with hardware switching, we could move up in speed to where it was going to be viable for all forms of communication. And uh, in 81, I, um, I wrote a paper uh, for the, uh, uh, when I got the award, the Harrison Award in Sweden, in Sweden the, 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 there was a speech that Conrad uh, and I won that award and were over in Sweden giving it and giving these papers. And the paper I gave at that point in time pointed out that, that packet switching would in fact go to fast packet and would in fact go to handle voice. And the time frame for that was going to take 20 years before the world would accept it. 
because from 1981, there was certainly 10 years before, even though it was then economic, and, and I showed the, the graph and everything else, I showed it was then economic to people like, it was going to take at least 10 years, just like it took 10 years after uh, the, the first packet fishing experiments before anybody found it viable. In fact, before they gave us the award in Sweden, it was 10 years before. Uh, uh, and it was the, the so it took quite a while for them to come to recognition that it was worthwhile in a lot of the world and do anything with it. And secondly, after that, it would take 10 more years before anybody would try and touch the current waste system that it was going. So that would have put it in 2001, more or less, that, that mm -hmm. I was projecting at that point the waste system might make some transition. Currently, I'm projecting in 2003, so it's not shifting much. Uh, somewhere in that time frame. Uh, actually, what will happen in, way before that is voice will travel over the ACM networks, and even though the voice network won't be touched, a lot of the voice will get diverted because we'll all put it on the ACM network. Or, or ACM network. Uh, what, what oh, ACM. ACM network. <coughs> now, the first thing to be offered, uh, the first thing to standardize is a full service with SMBS, that's the connection on version of ACM, and that uh, was uh, standardized by the Belcor and, and is being offered today and started in 1992. Frame Relay started in 91, it started in 92, and ACM will, uh, first service was offered this year, a few months ago, um, by several vendors, Sprint and and, 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 and and would be offered in, in 93 then. And it will grow to where it's more universal in 94, and by 95, it will be fairly widespread throughout the world. So you'll be able to have ACM service from most any place to any place. Uh, that's as a carrier service. Now, a lot of the development is going to go on in the local area networks in the local environment as well. But that's in the carrier environment. It's a very attractive uh, media because it can mix all of the types of signals and it has a huge scale in building. Um, one of the things in terms of this history then is to look at the, the uh, progression of, of the speed of service available to the user. Back in, uh, that may not be totally readable, uh, if anybody approves that without turning all the lights off yet, but um, back in 1969, the airplane started, and it was about 50 kilobits. The only other alternative was the, uh, the dial-up service and the public push phone phone network at 4.8 kilobits. It kept on increasing slowly up to where we have ISDN at, at uh, 56 kilobits. Uh, you probably need to. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll try it without it for Okay. Uh, ISDN is now at 56 kilobits, of course, uh, primarily used for uh, uh, video and fact. And the ARPANET progressed uh, as the private network on into the internet and grew very rapidly in terms of the. Uh, the uh, peak rate available to the user to uh, one and a half megabits and then up to uh, 45 megabits uh, in, the, in the internet. Uh, and then uh, as of today, there's a lot of uh, experimental nodes on the uh, ARPA research that are in the gigabit uh, range, although the internet itself doesn't have any gigabit nodes yet, so it will shortly. Uh, public service started with Telenet in, in 75 and um, has grown continuously uh, at stated at the same flat level of 50 kilobits or 56 kilobits for many, many uh, years, a decade or so. And then uh, the public service went to frame relay, SMBS, ATM, and, and will continue on up at speed to the one and two gigabit speed ranges. And at about OT48, I think is where people see the, the current uh, speeds, um, uh, you know, standardized to, but of course it will keep on going on above that as people need it. We, uh, everything can work smoothly on up. More, import more importantly might be price. Um, if, it, if it's affordable, people will use it. If it's not, they won't. Now this is that original curve I showed of the cost of computing and the cost of communication. And that uh, cost of communication came down. I made this curve in, in 19... Uh, 60, uh, well, no, about 1972 or so, I, I made this original curve, uh, and the 74. And that curve is still good today. 
that I, I bought the current leaf line for DS3s and uh, DS1s and DS3s for a leaf line network. And they still fall on that line. The internet today falls right on the line in terms of its cost per bit. And uh, so that line is actually held very well over time. Uh, the trend line for, you know, for leaf line communication. And of course, that's the composite curve for packet switching because the cost of computing is now way, way down. Uh, the ARPANET started not very efficiently on that curve, as you saw in that chart earlier. It was about 30% less efficient. Much better than circuit switching up top, but much less efficient. And as it grew into the internet, its cost, as it grew bigger and bigger, its cost has come on down to where right now it's the size of the biggest kind of commercial public network that you might want to build, uh, and is right on the line. Two commercial services have now price, uh, announced their ATM prices, AT&T and Wiltel. Wiltel is almost exactly at that point on the internet, uh, and now about three cents per kilosegment. Kilosegment is 64,000 bytes. Uh, it's, it's just a form of measurement of, of traffic. And AT&T's rate is just a little bit higher than that. So that you find that the ATM uh, prices and the frame relay prices are all falling almost on that curve. Now, they won't fall a lot below it because that is the cost of reach lines and people don't want to cut it a lot. And they won't fall a lot above it because, in fact, the people can build credit heads for that cost. And, and in fact, even that's already at that price. Uh, and so is the will tell. Will tell is out there competing with everybody in that uh, they don't have much chance to do anything but uh, compete at, at a reasonable price. So what my uh, estimate is is that the price will be between three cents going down to one cent for a fill segment over the next uh, few years, and that's pretty predictable at this point. For uh, long haul traffic in the U.S. And about 2001, it'll be free in part of the country. <laughs> 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 it's a log curve, it never gets there. Uh, uh, as you start sending all video, it will get very cheap, but uh, the video will still cost you the same amount for messages you're going to today. Uh, the telephone company still wants to be the only one tell you, no matter what you do. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, this is all of the different activities in terms of revenue, and uh, the uh, actual public data, X25 public data, never got very big in terms of revenue. Uh, tell that, and all of its competitors got to 500, <coughs> 800, and that, and that, and then we'll probably drop off from there, where the AGM will pick up, and pick up that thing. Fax has gotten very large in terms of voice. But it's all on the telephone network, and nobody keeps track of it too carefully. Now, this this curve uh, I've just updated with the internet traffic. This is the traffic that corresponds to that same revenue. Uh, and you see voices up there at the top. At uh, this is the total segments per year, which is not terribly interesting to anybody, but is a clean measure of something. Uh, <laughs> uh, the public and this log is logged with many, many decades here, but the public data network is way down the bottom. And the ARPANET and the internet has been growing all that time uh, to where today uh, it's uh, around a billion um, kilosegments a year, or in, in useful in terms that are probably more useful, about 500 megabits continuously during a working day, 500 megabits of traffic. Um, that's uh, not uh, like voice, voice is about a hundred uh, 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 gigabits of, tra of traffic at any point in time, but it is in fact uh, very substantial for all data. In fact, it's much more than all other forms of data. It's about equal to the private uh, data networks a few years ago. Actually, private data networks exceeded somewhat. And frame relay and SMDS, that's a projection that I have, and I'm not sure whether it's on that projection exactly. I've, I've um, I've checked uh, one or two data points on that, and it's, uh, they're almost on that. So the, the public services will probably see the internet shortly, or how they have, somewhere in that range. For its facts, it's considerably higher. So that puts it all in scale. But in terms of actual data traffic, the internet is the largest single network. This is a future projection of all of the traffic in the world, in the US. Uh, this is originating traffic in bits per second to make it a little easier to understand. And so, uh, voice is currently 100 uh, gigabits per second. That's the originating traffic of voice in the United States at any given point in peak minute. That's what we have. Uh, everything else is down below a gigabit in 1994. Uh, fax is the biggest thing. It's a gigabit or two. Uh, 
Uh, email, as I say, the internet and all of its traffic is down around a gigabit or a half a gigabit. And uh, the next thing probably that will rise up uh, quickly is, in fact, uh, TV on demand. TV on demand is very, very strong with uh, Warner and cable companies and the telephone companies trying to deliver you all your video takes on demand to your home, either over a wire pair or over your cable. And everybody's going to deliver ATMs to the home to deliver, to, deliver your, uh, to deliver your movies. And they think they can get another $30 a month out of you that way. And both the telephone company and the cable companies are trying to get both $30. And so they're trying to get both pieces of your money. When that happens, when, we, when, that, when the video conferencing, which is uh, probably lagged it somewhat, and the video on and TV on demand, which is more entertainment, gets to the, the level of voice or close to it, you'll find that the network is being paid for by video rather than voice. And the cost of bid is drastically changed because now we're paying for video and we're paying the same amount to these people who run the network and own all the fiber as we were paying all along. But we were just paying it now for bit much more effectively. Meanwhile, email has been rising all the time, and people are sending video clips and all that stuff, and it gets integrated with fax by them, so that by the time you get out another 10 years, you really can't tell the difference between the two. And broadcast TV never really makes it to be a very big contender because we're getting bandwidth with respect for nothing. Uh, uh, video on demand probably is much greater, but of course, received TV is much greater than that. That's what the traffic is. You see that the the upper total curve actually doesn't change much until the year 2000, and then it starts to increase somewhat. Now, to switch all of this traffic, we need to look at the, the long haul network. And the long haul network, um, uh, I've broken here the space of the speed of the switch into uh, domains where this is as fast as those switches can be in certain time frames. The X25 switches never could get above the 4 megabits or so. This is a very complicated protocol. Frame relay was somewhat faster. The MAN switches, which are SMBS switches, are somewhat faster than that. And now everybody's going to ATM switches in order to do the thing which are switches that can handle 100 megabits and on up, uh, almost any speed that you want to choose. And so anybody who's trying to offer public data services on this SMBS frame relay ATM current is now operating with ATM switches. All the carriers have chosen that as their vehicle for the future. Uh, their backbone will be ATM. Private data network will transfer to it, the fax will transfer to it, the fax between corporations and so on will get on it, and the voice eventually will, although not very quickly in terms of the uh, thing, because the voice net is so uh, large and so stable at the moment that public voice won't change. But as I introduce ATM to all the corporations and they start using it between their workstations, uh, they then start putting their voice on it, and it may in fact change the amount of voice in the public network pretty substantially. The way the local market is going to operate is, uh, uh, now this is the speed of the switches. The, speed, the switch performance in terms of uh, gigabits per second, uh, well, 100 kilobits per second, which is the, amp, the first proper amp, uh, on up to gigabits per second uh, in calling rates, I mean, millions of calls per second, 100, sorry, this is 100 calls per second on up to a million calls per second. And this is gigabits per second from 100 kilobits per second of the amp up to the current ATM, which is one to 10 gigabits that we're talking about. Now, X25 goes to about here. Uh, diagonal here, you have the message size that it can handle because uh, if you have a, a switch that's very fast, it has very few calls per second, it can't handle a very big message. Uh, whereas if it uh, handles a lot of messages and it's relatively slow, then it can handle a lot. Now, the routers are about 100,000 packets per second and about 100 bits per second, and therefore they can handle messages in the order of 100 bytes, which is a typical internet message, 100 or 200 bytes. So the internet traffic is currently handled all by routers and is handled by routers in this domain, and it's all of that size traffic. Now, one of the questions is, as all the ATM switches are being built for the protocol, which 293 is the uh, name of that protocol had up until the last month when it may have changed the name. Um, the protocol for quick setting up the call is very slow. It's very cumbersome and very long. It was designed for the end for voice, and it's a very slow protocol. So the question is, with the switches operating in this speed range, are we going to be able to handle anything of this size block? No, we're only going to be able to handle things 
in a murder block in terms of setting up a virtual circuit. But once it's set up, we can send lots of different things. And so we can have an email server and other things. And so people aren't too worried. I'm somewhat concerned, and actually the system that we're building, which is a 10 gigabit switch, will have a higher calling rate than that does budget they can make it. And we built a previous machine with a protocol called Class Select, which is much faster in terms of putting up calls, but that protocol hasn't been uh, standardized so that it's uh, not feasible to use that in general. Uh, but in fact, the ATM switches are all in that uh, range of 1 to 10 gigabits today, and uh, we continue to grow from there on out. Now, if you if you uh, look back at the, uh, oh, that's not that. If you look back at the previous slide, you'll see that um, what we need, even in the public network, to handle all the voice is only a 10 gigabit switch. So if we took all the voice in the country and you just need a switch even in Chicago, it was only 10 gigabits in size. So 10 gigabits is not something we're going to exceed immediately fast until we have a lot more video in the network. Okay, now in terms of the, the overall network, um, a lot of this activity is going to go into LANs, and LANs actually will be operating uh, with ATM switches in their central hubbing uh, place. Going out of the hubs to talk to all the terminals to say with Ethernet, or going out uh, with an ATM to those, or going out with Ethernet to those, or going directly to some of the ATM switch out to the server, depending on, on the, uh, the user. And a lot of this is already installed. The hubs are already there. And so connecting with that old legacy, you just put ATM switches in the center, and everything should work. The new technology is to go directly to the desktop with fiber or go out to a, a, a floor switch and then connect with either Cat3 fiber at 51 megabits or Cat5 fiber at 100 megabits. And the difference between Cat3 is what's installed typically today, and Cat5 is, is a new, highly twisted pair that uh, is more expensive to install. Um, and uh, typically, no installations today, except the newest ones, have had Cat5 installed. That can handle a somewhat higher speed, up to 50 megabits. ATM switches will also handle the, the uh, PBX traffic and the video traffic and the like. So, all of the local traffic within the campuses will switch over to that the voice, the video, and the um, data. And one last picture of what's going to be happening at the desktop. This is, this is a, um, um, an economic analysis of how much it costs to build the various kinds of cards and switches and so on to, to look at this. And if you take the total cost of delivering service to a desktop, the network interface card for the computer, the wiring for the, so the office, including the fiber or, or whatever it is in its installation, the floor switch, the, the switch is on the floor, and the building switch that's handling the whole building. And you look at all of that and sum it all up. Then, uh, for a different average throughput to the desktop. Now, today, the average throughput to the desktop may be a megabit or less. <coughs> but as that grows, either that is fine up until uh, a few megabits, two or three, and then that doesn't work much more, you go to switch to the next. That all converges to up to like 10 megabits because each switch you can add is direct to each terminal to the desktop. That would get you to about uh, $600. Uh, instead of the 400 that we see today, more or less. Total cost, switch, and everything else, um, and wiring. And then, we, after that, we have to step up to uh, one of these other alternatives. We can go direct from the basement to the fiber, ATM at 150 megabits, and that's very economic. As you get up to where you're using it all, the switch has to have put more in each one, so it's not some more, but it's pretty flat. Uh, or we can go with FDDI and CDDI, the uh, FDDI uh, takes off because of the high cost of the uh, interface. The CDDI has to have a floor computer as well. And then the other three alternatives are the three wire pair alternatives uh, for um, two for ATM, step three, step five fiber, and fast Ethernet. And they all, in fact, have somewhat more expensive interfaces, uh, it turns out, and they have to have this floor computer. In other words, they don't, they can't just go from the basement with one fiber all the way. They have to have a computer. So even though the fiber costs more to run by a slight amount, a few dollars, the, and the wire is a little bit cheaper, the uh, effect of that is that it costs more. Now, if you have the Cat3 fiber installed, Cat3 cable installed, 
it comes out about the same as the cat car, so the two come pretty much the same, but you have to install a cat car. But in any case, all of them start uh, at about $1,000 uh, for the user. And that's about where it will wind up this generation. Now, in a few years, that will keep on decreasing as we get the cost of chips down and everything else. It'll be more like it that over time. But the alternatives at the moment are those to get to the desktop. So that's sort of a um, look at the past and the present and the future. Um, now, let's open to questions and see if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask. Yes.
the Clinton administration around them? I don't think that they will turn around from what I've seen. And what I would guess is that since they're they're not mandating it for government for the industry, they're only mandating it for government purchases, that people will ignore it except for the government purchases. And they'll see that that's what's happening. Um, I don't know what anything else we can do because they seem to be uh, fixed in their mind. That's what's going on. So you're suggesting that it may go the way of Aiden? <laughs> yeah. Not long ago, you organized a committee that reviewed technical proposals for the ARPANET that met in Monterey. Um, I recall that I recommended DGN, but the committee recommended a different contractor. I've always been curious about how that changed. <laughs> <laughs>
and the, the ATM Plus uh, standard actually has three choices, DY64 and two other, either, none of the three are IP uh, for the long haul addressing. So, the, uh, so there's really no problem in terms of the ATM network, but, the, but they, do have to, they do want to keep the IP viable uh, so you can use an IP address from your terminal and not have to worry about anything else. And as a result, they're going to have to uh, take one of the two proposals or three proposals that are on the table. And I don't know what the decision is going to be. And they're going to have to make a decision between the, the three options. They've all been pretty well written up in all their fees, and, and I don't know the, the uh, current politics of which one they have accepted. Yeah. Is there anything that's going on in terms of intelligent information logical switching, in terms of being able to logically attach somebody's else's information, maybe it's a library of Congress or maybe you know, to some some library at some university. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't have the best thing in my mind. I'm sure a lot of the people here can help you with what they've seen around. You know, there's a lot of things that be going on in terms of, of uh, people building intelligent front ends, you know, that that search uh, for the right information and I don't have the knowledge of all of that myself. The more involved in the communications right yeah. Well, the the ARPANET was designed so that it could sort of survive um, in, in a a, uh, a war of any kind, conventional or otherwise. The uh, Paul Barron's original work was based on that concept, and that whole reason for what he did. Um, when I started building ARPANET, I wasn't that concerned about it, but in selling it to the Defense Department, we obviously <laughs> <laughs> used that as one of the arguments, and the basic design is extremely reliable, I mean, in terms of having you know, multiple connections, so that it was, in fact, very saleable, and has been very viable to the Defense Department as a, as a result. And so I think it would be quite quite reliable in today's internet would probably would, would scan anything. There's so many interactions already. Well, even now, usually, yeah. Doesn't that also make it kind of difficult to regulate the Uh, but that's the basic switch that could occur and go back again at some point in time. 
But at the moment, people are looking at ATM, even within the new technologies that are coming along, the new hardware technologies, as the basic means for communications. And, and getting a standard through like that is so difficult that it's not likely that another one will happen very soon. Now, clearly it'll evolve, it'll evolve, it'll evolve. And, and maybe, you know, at some point people will say, let's have an alternate packet size of, you know, some larger size so that we can you know, do something like that. But, you know, it's not particularly clear that, that it will change very rapidly because of the huge amount of effort and standards. And everybody is following it because of the standards activity. And the reason they're doing it is because they know that other people will be doing it because of that. Yes. If you look back in the past and think about what we're dealing with the standards committee, standards committee, that kind of thing, sort of you call it because they didn't want to go your way. Do you think at the time when mm -hmm. something didn't go one way that you really felt something about it? Well, there were two major things happening in the time frame with the, the standards. One was the, uh, the getting X25 passed was the arguments of the French who wanted the, uh, their way. <laughs> and so it was just very difficult because it wasn't logical. They just had to have their piece of the, the standard their way, whatever it was. And in fact, they did get the D bit, you know, so that you know you have this thing where there's no flow control, you know, or there is, you know, more or less. Um, the other big uh, fight was datagram versus virtual circuit, and that way that happened not only here in the United States where. Uh, after I left ARPA, I left it with Bob Kahn and Sir, and then fought hard for datagrams and, and TCPIP, and of course, won over the entire research community because he owned it, you know, in terms of paying for it. And uh, <laughs> the military community, because he paid for that too. So, you know, the, uh, the government wound up going that way. And of course, the, the big driver was really uh, the fact that uh, Metcalf went that way with Ethernet. So, in fact, that's the reason why. Uh, TCPIP took over is not because of anything that happened in the uh, research so much, as it happened to affect a few people who then put it into the Ethernet. Um, meanwhile, the uh, commercial industry was all done with virtual circuits because that was really necessary in order to uh, do the kind of thing we were doing in those days, which is terminal to host communications. And in order to get the standards down to the terminal level so we could build and, and offer terminal processors. And the question was asked earlier. Why don't we have terminal processors? One of the reasons is there's no standard for interfacing it to the network uh, today, where there was an X25. That X29 was created as a standard, and without virtual circuits, we wouldn't have had standards at that level to do the conversion from text into packets. So um, there was this big fight that went on in CCRDT as well, though, about, uh, about virtual circuits versus datagrams. And uh, there was a bunch of people. Um, one of the French guys, uh, and not not the people who are working on X25, but another group. IBM took up the cause for one point, one point, I don't know why, because they wanted to be contrary. Actually, they wanted, IBM's general philosophy was to stop the standards if they could, because it was better for them. So anything that seemed to stop it was good, was something they support in some way. And there was a bunch of other groups that supported it, so that we went on that fight for a while, but the, the carriers were so clearly of a, of, a, of a concern that they had to have something that could be standardized down a little that they could operate it worldwide at the terminal level and the host level that it didn't make any progress at that level. And it just created a fight that, that didn't get anywhere. On the other hand, it created this uh, total dichotomy at the LAN and uh, one mile level for many, many years. Now we're integrating it all into how do we put IP on top of ATM and get it all into one thing. Finally, being resolved, uh, where we have you know, one media that's trying to carry both. But uh, you know, the whole technical reason for datagrams was that we had such a um, uh, uh, terrible time doing uh, uh, and memory in our in our computers that we didn't have room for VC tables. We couldn't keep track of our circuits if we wanted to. Uh, nowadays, that's no problem at all. I mean, and even a few years later, like in by 1975, there was no problem keeping track of the VCs and the thing. And so then, by then, it was that the communications were so expensive compared to computing that we really wanted to save the computing over the communications overhead of this big header. And a pack and a datagram header is huge compared to a VC header, and it takes up much more bandwidth. And so the big argument from an economy economy point of view was to get rid of that header and go with VCs. 
there was also the philosophical you know, argument that some people in the circuit world liked the VCs better because it was more like what they used to know. But I think more to the point in my mind was that it saved uh, our money and so on, and it allowed us to have the standards that we needed. But today, a lot of those reasons are gone. And the, uh, the, the history is that we have it in land, and that's the way that the terminal will work and all of the computers and the interfaces and the drivers. And so we've got to be compatible with that. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of work to now string all out because as we go to video, we need to also establish virtual circuits. So we have to be able to do both in sync And that battle will continue for quite a while now. And it'll, be, it'll continue to give us some headaches. Yeah. Is there a sort of third point in the early development of ATM where it became clear that big size uh, tells us the right thing to do with the idea of surface in the air? Was there any about that? It wasn't any clear point in time until uh, about 1981, where we saw that the speed of the, the switching was going to get to the place. And we didn't even imagine things at gigabit speeds at that time. So when we started thinking in terms of things over 100 megabits, we knew we couldn't do it in software. And we had to do it, we had to have hardware. Hardware is really hard to do it on a variable life basis. I mean, you know, 10 years from now it'll be quite reasonable, but today it's not that attractive. And secondly, um, we did want to subdivide voice, video, and all those things into fixed size pieces anyway, so we could handle them reasonably in a variable length. So it's only particularly valuable for messages where we might be able to use that size message or something by itself. In other words, we had to subdivide it anyway, so we only divided it into packets. Fairly quickly to begin with. So, fixed length made a lot of sense very quickly. I think we probably need to break pretty soon, right? Yeah, probably. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that.